We welcome all of you today, and today is a special day because the Lord is in our midst. Amen? Amen. Expecting the promised king. How many of you are expecting the promised king? Amen. Amen. A lot of people expected the promised king, and he did come. Amen? Amen? But now we are expecting our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he promised to come back. Amen? Earlier this month, in um, USA Today, I read an article that really caught my attention. And the title of the article says, Teacher who told kids, Sender, isn't real, removed from New Jersey School District. And that really caught my attention. I said, what's going on? And I read the story. And to summarize the story, this teacher, this is a substitute teacher, decided in her first grade class to tell her student, I don't know how the story went, if the student asked about um, the Santa or this or that, about Christmas. And she decided to break the news, to break the truth to the kids. First grade student. And you know, first grade students, all their imagination, all their excitement about Christmas, you know, period or season is about Santa and the gift they receive. And so she said, I'm sorry to tell you, Santa is not real. Um, and um, the reindeers don't fly. She went on and she said that all the presents that you receive are not from Santa. They are from your parents. What do you think happened? I don't know how the kids reacted. I know how the parents reacted because the parents were not happy. And when the, 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 the principal, the, 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 you know, the president of the school heard about it, you know what happened? She got fired. Not only from the school, but the district. And one teacher, one, um, one um, it says, the principal, the superintendent, he said he apologized to all the parents. And he says, she's no longer working in the school district. And I asked myself, could we believe that? She got fired for telling the truth. It's it's just the truth. But sometimes telling the truth causes you pain and even your job. Why? Because society has already accepted that white lie, if you can call it. I don't know. But one of the mothers, she says this, that really got me thinking. She says... Trying to find it. She says, the teacher was trying to ruin the holiday season spirit for the student by telling them that Santa isn't real. And the parents just buy presents and put them under their tree. And so the question was, what is the holiday spirit was this parent talking about? The last time I checked, friends, Christians claim to celebrate the birth of Jesus. What's the truth about the celebration? Because if it's Christmas, it's about Jesus, right? And so if somebody says Santa is not real, why should we um, blame the, 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 the teacher and even fire the person. And I was thinking, if one of you was a parent, would you defend this teacher? If one of you was a co-worker, would you go and stand for that teacher? Or you'd be like, that was stupid. You shouldn't have said that. 
And you can, we, can, we can debate. Maybe it wasn't her place to break that news to them. But the truth is the truth. Whether we accept it or not is just the truth. And sometimes in this life, especially in this society, you have to think twice before you decide to tell the truth as it is to people. And that's why a lot of us find it very difficult to stand for Christ. Many of my friends say that Jesus is the reason for this season. Am I right? And others say they would like to bring Jesus back into the Christmas season. And I ask the question, if that is the case, if we want to bring Christ back to this season, how is that possible when Jesus was not really the reason why the season or the celebration began? How can you bring somebody back into something when he was not there when he began? I wish the message was about the origin of Christmas or how the devil gets worship during this season. This season. But I was reminded, you know, this is not the time for us to be spending so much time talking about how the devil receives worship in this season. I was reminded it is God's Sabbath. It is his day, so I should lift him up, amen? And so I'm not going to talk about the origin of Christmas today. You can do that by yourself. And um, I suggest that you do it because it's very enlightening to know how it all began. But since a lot of you have come to church today to listen about Jesus Christ, let's talk about him, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're here in your house because we believe that You have created the world, you have created us, and you reminded us that on the seventh day we should keep it holy and come and worship you. We are here to listen to you. Speak to us, for our hearts are open, our minds are open, and we pray that whatever the devil is doing to distract us, to take away what you have for us today, please keep us from it and help us, Father, to receive your message understand it, and also allow it to bear fruit in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Expecting the promised king. Friends, I will be a fool to assume that many of us or many of you aren't thinking about the birth of Jesus Christ in this season. I'll be a fool to believe that. Whether you like it or not, Whether you celebrate it or not, society is forcing us to get on board. Amen? And that's the truth. So on Wednesday, some of us went to um, this hospice um, at uh, Maria, Maria's um, hospital. And we had a program for the old people. They were expecting us to come. And they wanted us to to sing, you know, um, the songs of their seasons. And um, so we began to sing. And you know the songs that we sing during this season? We sang, and they all started singing with us. They were singing the same song we're singing, but they were singing in Japanese. And so what happened? After the songs were over, something happened. I don't know if they noticed it, those who were with me. But they were enjoying the songs. Everybody was happy. Then it was time for what? The message. And the devil knew. I was not going to spend time talking about what happened before. I was going to spend more time talking about what's coming. And so, all these old people, as soon as I started speaking, they started complaining. Oh, I need this thing. Then the staff came to help. And there was just, you know, a commotion in the audience. And I was like, while we were singing a while ago, nobody complained. Nobody, you know, was asking help. But as soon as the message started, this happened. Why? And then I asked myself, could it be? That during this season, 
There are people who just want to be entertained by the songs, but they are not really seeking to know more about Jesus that we claim to celebrate. Could it be that we are just entertaining people every year? And the rest of the year, we don't have a message for them? Sometimes it's discouraging to, 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 to be planning an outreach program while people are not responding to you. So I was speaking and I was looking at them. Some were listening, but majority was not. And what really struck me right after the message, there was another program for them. And these people went back to their happy faces. And the celebration went on. And then I said, did we really achieve what we came for? In reality, you don't need to be a Christian to sing those songs. Do you know that? They were not Christians, but they knew those songs. They were singing it. I don't know if they believed it, but they were singing it. And so, thinking about it, I said, if that's the case... Maybe we might not be the only one to do this. Others can do this. We need to have something different, right? We need to have something different. If we are just doing the same thing others are doing, and sometimes they're not even Christians, but they're doing it, then what is our message? Though that was, uh, you know, an eye opener for me this week as we, we, we share that with the old people. But I believe maybe one person got the message, maybe two got the message. We need to be out there and share what we know. That's all we can hope for. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. Amen? How much about Christmas, friends? It's about Jesus. Take some time this weekend, and I, I pray that you, you, you may get some insight from the origin so that the things that you do, you do, you do them because you, you're convicted. Um, last, two weeks ago, I was at Nambu Church, and I preached a message um, a little bit similar to this. But at the end of the message, we were talking with some members, and they were asking me questions about Christmas and, and stuff like that. And one asked um, if it, you know, it was okay you know, to have a Christmas tree. And I said, um, do you know why you have a Christmas tree? And the person said, no. I didn't give the person an answer. But I said, well, it will be good that you know why you have a tree. Because everything we do, we should have a reason why we do it. Not because everybody else is doing it, right? So I asked the question back to the person. Do you know why you do it? If you don't know why you do it, then go research why you do it. If it's okay with you, go on. But sometimes people want us to tell them what the truth is. But no, you should search for yourself so that it becomes something that I am doing because I know what I'm doing. Rather than I'm doing because everybody else is doing it. And that should be a principle every Christian should have. A lot of things we do even at church, we need to know why we do it. Not because people did it before, it becomes tradition, not something spiritual. Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 1 that she will bring forth a son and his name shall be called what? Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their the sins. And so my question is, why don't we talk about the problem of sin during this season? Why don't we call people to repentance during this season if his coming was really to deliver us from our sins? And, and it's very interesting to see how we celebrate this season and a lot of times we let people go and they don't even know what they're doing wrong. We let people go, and they don't have that need of a Savior. They enjoy it. They look forward 
to it next year, but the whole year, they're not seeking a savior. And that is, that is something we need to do to call them out and and open their eyes to see that the problem of sin is not a yearly event. It is a daily, moment-by-moment event. And Christ is not just waiting to come in once a year to deal with your problem of sin. He's doing that right now, every day, every second. Isn't that a beautiful thing? For people to understand that Jesus came... To deliver us from sin. But he hasn't finished that job yet. He's still working on that. And that door is open for us. To go. By faith. On our knees. And asking him. Please help me. Help me overcome sin in my life. That's the reason why he came. In the gospels. The Bible tells us. That when Jesus was was born. His birth was revealed to two different groups. You know the story. How many groups? Two. Can you tell me who are they? The first group, the shepherds. They were Jews. The second group, wise men from the east, heathens. Two different groups. The good thing about the story is that everyone, everyone knows it. So I don't actually have to go back and read the story to you again. You know the story. But seldom do we stop and ask questions. How did it happen that an entire nation who was supposed to be expecting a promised king missed his coming? That's the first question. How is it that the Jews, since the beginning knew that God has promised them a a king that will come from the, 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 the lineage of David, and they were expecting this king, this baby. But when he was born, they missed it. Why did they miss it? How in the world did the wise men from the east, heathen people, How in the world did they know about this and came all the way to see this boy? Have you ever asked the question? How many people out there are asking this question? You know, in Great Controversy, page 314, listen to what Ellen White says. She says, there is no evidence when, you know, the... When the angels came to earth to give this good news, she says there is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparation for the prince of life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful tidings when he discovers what? A group of shepherds who are watching their flocks by night And as they gaze into the starry heavens, are contemplating the prophecy of the Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's Redeemer. Here is a company that is prepared to receive the heavenly message. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appears, declaring the good tidings of great joy. Amen. That angel was about to go back to heaven and say, I'm sorry, Lord, there's no one, no one in Bethlehem that is expecting the birth of our Savior. But there was a group of shepherds. They were thinking, they were talking, they were meditating about the prophecy. They found where? In the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. 6 and 7, go to, go to the book of Isaiah. Let's go there and read it for ourselves. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 to 7. Are you there? I'm giving you another 10 seconds. Come on, find it. 
Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. The Bible says, for unto us a child is what? Is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform what? This. His name indeed shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. And so they were thinking and, and talking about this, this, this king that was to be born. This wonderful and counselor and mighty God, everlasting father. Then the angel said, well, these guys are expecting you. Let me tell them the good news. And the Bible says they came and looked for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And they saw them. And they were so happy. They went into the streets and they told everybody about the good news. How many people went to see Jesus? How many people were happy for that news? Unfortunately, nobody cared. Do you feel that way sometimes? You're excited about the news. You're excited about, about a message or a promise. And you tell people... They just look at you like, uh-huh, okay. It can be discouraging, friends. But it doesn't matter. They went to see the king. They shared their testimonies. But it was not heard. It was not, people didn't take actions on that. They were studying prophecy, friends. They were thinking about the words of the prophets Isaiah. Many Jews were busy following the traditions, the rituals, without understanding the, the true meaning. Everything, friends, everything the Jews did was pointing to Jesus. Every single thing. But their religion became formality, missing on the spiritual aspect of everything. God instructed them. To do all these things because God wanted them to be thinking about the coming Savior. The Lamb of God. And prophecy, friends, does not look backward. Prophecy looks where? Forward. And so everything God gave them, he was preparing them for what was coming. And so they needed to be watching and praying. And expecting every single day. See how the Lord is? He doesn't want you to stay in the, in the past. He wants you to look forward to what he's preparing for you. But many times, a lot of us, we enjoy staying in the past. A lot of painful things happen to many of you. And sometimes it's just difficult. To look forward. And we spend time thinking again about those things that hurt. Friends, you have to let go. And let God. The other group, friends, were the heathens, the wise men. They were not part of the holy nation, but somehow they were interested about the king of Jews. Because... They read about him somewhere, probably in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Are you there? Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. The Bible says, the wise men came from the east to Jerusalem and they were asking a question. This is a question that asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? 
For we have seen his star in the east and have come to do what? To worship him. Pretty interesting. The Jews themselves had no clue that this was happening. People from the east were studying prophecy. And they said, we have seen his star in the east. How did they know? Let's go to the book of Numbers. Numbers 24, verse 17. Friends, nothing that happens, happens without God revealing. Everything about the, 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 the first advent of Christ has been predicted. So it's not new. So if they were in the books, if they were in Scripture, they would have known. See, how many of us really get into Scripture and look forward? We know it, we do it, we say it. But how many really are studying and are serious about it? Are you there? It says, I see him. This is Balaam, that false prophet, right? He received this, this dream, um, this vision. This is the fourth, the fourth prophecy in the book of Numbers. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of where? Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. Friends, they were studying and they knew about this star. Those two groups of people were looking into the future. They were looking for the coming king and they were not overlooked. When you spend time with God. When you are studying prophecy and you're expecting the promise God has promised you, God does not overlook you. He reveals himself to you. You will not be taken by surprise, friends. And that is what he wants for his children. He does not give us those prophecies so that we can just say, oh, we have them. No, he wants us to understand them. He wants us to study them. He wants us to be ready when he comes. Isn't that a loving father? A loving king? A loving God? So my question is, are you seeking God? Because those heathens, they they sought him and they found him. The Bible says, you shall seek me and you shall do what? You shall find me if you do what? If you search and you seek for me with all your heart. How many of us are really seeking Christ? Even in this season. Sometimes it's from one party to another, then to another, then to another. And a lot of times, Jesus is not in those parties. My wife was singing a while ago, if Christmas is the birth day of Jesus, so why don't we have a line for him? He has been forgotten. Are we seeking Jesus daily? Is that all that he talks about to you? At what point does he tell you about his second coming? Is that an important prophecy regarding our Redeemer? Does he remind you of his work right now in the heavenly sanctuary? If you're seeking Christ daily, if you're remembering him, his birth daily, does he remind us of the work he's doing right now? In the heavenly sanctuary. Does it remind you that you have just a short time, friends, to completely surrender and confess all your sins and be forgiven while he's still there? Is that something people need to understand? So when 
do we tell the world about this? If you were Jesus, which of those truth would you want your children to emphasize in the last days? I thought about those questions. And I wish Adventists had a day to remember and preach what Christ is doing now and his second coming. We don't, do we? Every Sabbath is an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity. Your name is a message. Do you know? Your name, Adventist, is a message in itself. But how many times do we tell people about the coming Lord? This is of Ages, page 6, it says, With eager steps, these wise men, they press onward, confidently expecting the Messiah's birth to be the joyful burden of every tongue in the city. But their inquiries are in vain. Entering the holy city, they repair to the temple. They, to their amazement, they find none who seem to have a knowledge of the newborn king. Their questions call forth no expressions of joy, but rather of surprise and fear, not unmingled with contempt. I'll end by saying this. After the long journey, they had been disappointed by the indifference of the Jewish leaders and had left Jerusalem less confident than when they entered the city. Imagine people coming from outside into our church the people of the book, the people that, who started this movement, studying prophecy. And when they come, nobody's interested about prophecy. And nobody is talking about Jesus is coming soon. And nobody is telling people that probation is closing. Will they also feel the same way? Disappointed? Sometimes that's how we portray our message. The promise has been given. The Lord is keeping his promises, but his children are not looking forward to those promises. As we close, friends, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born, the whole world almost missed it. God's people almost missed it. If you see the ratio, it's, in, in, it's not significant because only... A group of shepherds and heathens. And so I'm asking myself today, 2,000 years later, what does the devil gain in remembering Christ every year? If 2,000 years ago he did not want anyone to expect him, what does he gain today? For everyone remembering Jesus' birth. And I thought about it. I said, he must have something he's gaining in this. Yes, a lot of people do not celebrate Christmas as Christians do. Christmas, for many people, is something different. But for Christians, many of us, right? We celebrate. They celebrate the birth of Christ. But Satan 
is getting something out of it? Do you know what he's getting? While majority is looking backward once a year, friends, something is happening right now and it's about to happen. The devil is happy by keeping us looking backward while probation is closing. And every year, we can't help but think backward. And somebody said, imagine you driving a car, moving into a direction, and every time you're just looking in that rearview mirror, there's nothing wrong looking back. But if your whole attention is in that rearview mirror, what's going to happen, friends? You're going to crash. You need to look forward. Look backward to check if where you're going is where you're supposed to go. Because prophecy that was accomplished helps us to be confident in what is coming. Because, because it happened and it was fulfilled... We know for sure that what is coming will also be fulfilled. Amen. This is not the first time tradition has overtaken Christ's present truth. And I will give you this last illustration. It's a true story. Jesus Christ, before he, he passed away, before he was put to the cross... The whole nation was celebrating which feast? The Passover. And he said to his disciples, prepare the Passover. But while the Passover was going on, when all the Jews were looking backward to what God has done in Egypt, Jesus was telling his disciples, I am about to die for you. I am that Passover lamb. Do not look backward because I'm about to give myself for you. He was among them. He was there with them. But no, they were busy looking backward to a lamb that they used. But the lamb was among them and they missed him. And Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. Every time you drink of this juice and you eat of this bread, you remember me until we do what? We eat together where? Friends, is he telling them to look forward to something, yes or no? Does that make sense to you? Jesus is doing the same thing today. While the world and majority of Christians look back to the birth of Christ, Jesus is getting ready to return, friends. While the Christians entertain the world on Christmas, Jesus' intercessory work in heaven is coming to an end. Understand it. As Satan receives worship through other things during this period, Christians claim to remember Christ, who is supposed to be remembered daily in their lives and while we look backward probation is closing right before our eyes I am not telling you not to remember Christ during this season my message for all of us don't look Don't lose focus on what is happening now and what is about to happen. Jesus loves us so much that he wants us to get it the second time. Amen. They missed it. Nothing we can do about it. But now we can do something about his second coming. Can we? My prayer all of us 
is that will you stand different in a world that does not care about the truth? Will you stand apart in a church that follows what everybody does, hoping to change people's understanding of Jesus? Would you let your voice be heard in a society that wants nothing to do with God? And when the people are unwilling to leave their sinful practices, everyone will have to make a stand. And today I'm making mine. What will be yours? What will be your stand? Let's all stand. And as we sing this closing hymn, I pray that you will look forward for the completion of what he has has done when he came the first time.